everyone. Welcome to the museum. I have no idea what you went through. Uh, I arrived about five minutes ago. And uh, I must say, I drove into town uh, when the Pope was in town, and it was much faster. <laughs> I don't know how to treat that. He's always a hard act to follow, but I never thought I'd run into anything like this. Anyway, we are delighted to do our program in which we partner with the Smithsonian. Mary McLaughlin is here from the Smithsonian, as well as the volunteers. So always delighted to have them, as well as have you. You're always a, a great audience to have here. The, uh, the subject today is, and as you know of the program, uh, covers folks who have gone public, as it were. Whistleblowers, leakers, or terrorists, or traitors, you decide. Uh, it was one of my duties in, in CIA to handle people who had defected, uh, including Arkady Shevchenko, who was the highest ranking defector we ever had. He was an undersecretary of the UN. And I, I invariably found a number of them uh, are very conflicted about what they had done, uh, about whether they wanted to go public, whether they should go public, and about their motivation. And I think we'll see some of that in the subjects that we treat. Uh, what, were they, what was their purpose? What were they really up to? And of course, the, the sort of bellwether word of our, of our times is Snowden. Uh, it is, I can tell you, because I've discussed it with a number of people who've come here as visitors, students, and so forth, it actually is, there's a generational divide. I can guess how many of you feel, but some of you may not feel that way about Snowden. Others do. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon of our time. And I think what you'll find is that that has been true of other times of some of the people we'll be treating. Uh, Martin and Mitchell, the defectors uh, from NSA, Daniel Ellsberg, Pentagon Papers, and of course, Snowden himself. So today we'll be treating Herbert O. Yardley, very interesting figure, and I think we'll have a very interesting presentation by Bill Lahneman. Uh, Dr. Lahneman is an associate professor of Homeland Security at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach. So welcome up here, Bill. We tried to have a nicer day, uh, but we weren't able to, to manage it. He's also a senior researcher at the Center for International Security Studies at Maryland, at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, and has written a number of public, uh, publications, uh, including on the subject of information flow in the intelligence community. So I think he's uh, certainly well qualified. He's also a Naval Academy graduate. Is that correct, yeah. Bill? So welcome. We're delighted to have you here. We're very pleased to have all of you here. So help me welcome Bill. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me OK from this position? I think I probably will have to stay somewhat stationary uh, as I speak to, to make sure. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I am going to uh, sort of tell you a story today and raise a couple of questions and, you know, see, hopefully have time, definitely have time for questions and answers and see how you feel about it. But I do want to uh, actually ask first, uh, who before has heard about Herbert Yardley in the audience? If you could raise your hand. Okay, all right, so not, I thought I might have an audience of, you know, Yardley uh, experts because uh, depending on the number of intelligence community, um, you know, uh, people affiliated with the intelligence community in the audience, they more or less do tend to be aware of him. Okay, well, good, and that, that solves part of my problem. I just want to ask you all to uh, kind of listen to my story, have an open mind, and see what you uh, think about it. All right, well, my story is about... Um, Herbert Yardley, but who in the audience has heard of Edward Snowden? <laughs> okay, all right, very good. So uh, I do want to, at the end, come back to sort of a Snowden-centered question, all right? Uh, for those of you who do not, uh, just very quickly, uh, Edward Snowden was an, a contractor for the National Security Agency, and in 2013, he blew the whistle on, among other things, this uh, Project PRISM, 
that the National Security Agency uh, was carrying out. Project PRISM dealt with the uh, bulk collection of Americans' telecommunications data, which of course required, the, you know, uh, that information had to come from our telecommunications companies, so involvement of the private sector. Um, the data that actually was collected was metadata, which is typically called data about the data, meaning uh, if you're making a phone call, for example, it doesn't say that John Smith made a phone call and talked about these items. That's the content, right? But it, it did say that at such and such a time, uh, usually at such and such a geographical location, someone called from this number to that number. The call lasted so many minutes. Okay, so it doesn't have um, personally identifying data uh, associated with it. Now, of course, we uh, have to have warrants to uh, tap into person's, you know, private information. So in this case, we had uh, warrants that authorized the bulk collection sort of in a more general fashion than is usually the case, because usually you have to say, I mean, what are we looking for? Who are the persons or places suspected? Um, so just that, that I'll get to that later. Uh, these warrants, since it was a sensitive intelligence matter, had to do with uh, a, a judge from the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. So it was a secret, secretly issued warrant, but the judge had heard the case and, and in this case had granted it. Um, the reason they're doing it is to data mine this huge amount of metadata so that they could maybe pick up hidden patterns of behavior that would point to suspicious activity, and in particular, terrorism. So, you know, it was a new project. The technology itself had been developing since the 1980s, but it's gotten a lot better and in use, wide use, and so the intelligence community was trying this out. So uh, I did want to inject another term. It's a big data project, okay? Big data meaning just the explosion in uh, data that's available in a digital format in virtual form. And so uh, if you have the right software and, and hardware, you can go ahead and, and mine or look for patterns in enormous amounts of data that's never been available before. OK, so um, I do just want to mention that beginning in the late 80s, data mining began to be considered a separate discipline. So I mean, it's not what you would call a brand new discipline. It's just the computing power has gone up, its storage capacity has gone up, and processing speed has gone up. So it's gotten more and more prevalent. It builds on machine learning, the field of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and statistics. And it, you know, different types of data mining marry that in different ways. I want to give you a couple quick examples just to sort of cement it, you know, in, in reality. Uh, supermarkets, when you swipe your card, you know, if you're a member of the club, whatever, at the supermarket, goes into a big data bank. They don't care about who you are. They just care that you're a shopper and what you bought, right? So, um, and they can go many different ways with this, but one of the supermarket chains just mine data to see people who buy X also buy Y. What are the patterns? What are the hidden patterns? And remember, when you apply for those cards, they do know, they know your name ultimately, but they don't care. But they know if you're a man, a woman, you know, data of that nature. So they found out that young males, that is to say married young males, went to supermarkets and bought baby formula and beer. <laughs> right? Those were two very prevalent patterns that just, just sang out when they looked at this data. So they get their team working on it. And it turns out that, you know, when uh, families have very young children, the mother is taking care of the child, and the husband runs off, I need formula, and run off to get formula. Well, as long as I'm at the store, why don't I grab that, that beer? You know, so they found it. It was uh, sort of an iron law. So what did they do? And maybe you could check when you get to your... Uh, your supermarket next time, supposedly the beer and the baby formula are fairly close to each other, or they are on the same pathway, you know, to and from the, the beer or the baby, or the baby formula. So that's an example of how it's put to use, and all that is used is metadata in that case. Now, the other one is, uh, the other example I want to give has to do with the healthcare industry. And it turns out in Canada, by uh, having a great deal of instrumentation on very young, you know, newborns, they can actually predict that that child is going to, to have some kind of medical problem, whether it be an infection or some other kind of condition. And the computing speed is so fast, they do not have to save the data. They don't have to archive it. But by processing it and looking for the patterns, they can actually say, 
you know, baby Smith uh, looks like it has an impending problem with this, and they can actually be preventive. So those are, that's a case where they do use the actual data, not the metadata. But uh, it's, it's pretty profound, really. It's, it's really quite, quite amazing if you think about it. Okay, so back to Project PRISM. If a pattern of behavior that was suspicious was detected, then law enforcement could say, that's suspicious. We think this person might be a terrorist. Then they would go to a judge and get a traditional search warrant. And they would open up a law enforcement investigation on that person. That person's name and, and other data would be released and they would, uh, law enforcement would use all the necessary, you know, rules and, and uh, abide by all the constitutional protections, privacy and so on and so forth. So that's how it, how it was working. Edward Snowden blew the whistle on this secret program. So here is the Fourth Amendment just by way of review. We are a guaranteed freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. And to get a reasonable search and seizure, whatever that might be, you need a warrant. And the only way you get a warrant is by probable cause. And the, the warrant must describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So the Fourth Amendment is quite specific on that. And it's specific because during the colonial period, the British uh, colonial officials, the magistrates in particular, were issued these things called general warrants. I mean, in British law, they too were protected. Their privacy was protected. But these general warrants existed, which basically said, you are a magistrate. Uh, we have confidence in you. Therefore, you are able to search anywhere you want for anything at any time, which, if you think about it, neutralizes the whole idea of having a warrant. So uh, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights specifically said, we're looking for specifics before we allow somebody's privacy to be violated. OK, so that's just setting the stage. That's sort of quick information on Snowden. Uh, there has been quite a lot happening since his revelations. I'm going to get to that later. Because for now, I want to start talking about uh, our subject today, Herbert Yardley. And he uh, has the distinguished title, I mean, you know, generally considered the father of American cryptology. And that's a picture of him. I know the quality is not the best, but a happy guy, young guy, I think about 27 years old, uh, sitting there maybe in 1916 on the uh, portico there of the old executive office building, which is where he happened to work. Okay? So, so that's Herbert. Let me give you a little bit on cryptology. I probably don't have to, but you know, in any case, uh, a short definition of cryptology is code making and code breaking. So think about what has to go into that. Um, you have to somehow procure whatever it is that you want to decipher. Let's look at it from the decipher or decoding side of things. Uh, this can involve illegal activity. It certainly involves secret activity because the reason you're trying to get this is to uh, gain some advantage over some uh, bargaining partner, potential enemy, somebody, you know, you want to know what they're thinking, what they're intending in secret so that you can adjust either your negotiations or your war fighting or whatever, you know, kind of uh, is, at, is at stake. So nowadays this involves a lot of, uh, you know, intercepts, wireless intercepts and things like that, but there's some really interesting stuff that was going on back here, like uh, physically grabbing code books and developing invisible ink, you know, on letters and seeing stuff like that, as well as, as decoding and de deciphering telegrams and such. It also involves translation, okay? So think back in 1914, 15, how many uh, native-born Americans, uh, solid citizens, spoke Japanese fluently? You know, it just wasn't that kind of world. So this presented some real opportunities and problems if you're trying to be a cryptologist back then. All right, so Yardley, he was born in 1889 in Worthington, Indiana, sort of the heartland of America. An interesting fact is that the center, the geographic center of America, which gets plotted periodically, you know, it was like 20 miles from his, his town. So he's like your ultimate all-American, from the heartland kind of guy. And if you see his accomplishments, I mean, he, he was quite a fellow. I mean, he's a president of his high school class. I should say at the beginning, there were 18 students in his high school class, okay? It's, it's Worthington, Indiana, 
in 1910, whatever. Um, he was the attorney of the High School Literary Society, which sounds really cool. And I had a lot of trouble finding out what that actually meant. Does anybody know what it means to be attorney of your high school literary society? No, but I, I think what it means is he was quite an orator. You know, he really was great at public speaking and inspirational speaking and so on and so forth. If you tie that to the president of the class, I mean, I think you've got a leader, okay? He acted in his high school plays. He was captain and quarterback of his high school football team. He, he was really very smart, too. He, he did well in school. And uh, I had to figure out where to put this in, but he's a poker player. I mean, a dead serious, world-class poker player that he learned as a teenager in the various pool halls on the main street of Worthington, Indiana, which was a railroad town, a railroad depot, sort of in a transcontinental sense. But, if you can read that, um, he was expelled from high school a few weeks before graduation. So what a, what a complex personality, huh? Um, he did, uh, he was liked, he was well liked, it was a regrettable affair. And so he ended up just kind of going to Michigan for three weeks or something like that, which had, you know, different school boards, jurisdictions, and he graduated from high school three weeks after he would have normally graduated. Another insight, the reason he was expelled from high school is he refused to apologize for a prank that he and some of his classmates played as part of what uh, I think nowadays at my kid's high school we call Spirit Week, where you're getting up for the big game and the junior class and the senior class are competing and so on and so forth. And what they did is they uh, hung a flag from the, the bell tower of this, this school and apparently it was in bad taste and the, not evidently in bad taste, right? It was just the faculty interpreted it as you are making fun of us, the teachers. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be, you know, you and the juniors are supposed to be uh, competing with each other for spirit. So apologize, right? And uh, the seven people involved, five apologized right off and then slap on the hand, don't do it again. Herbert and his best friend Bill said, no, we, we didn't mean it to be, um, you know, uh, an insult. It was just about the junior class. And so since he felt that, you know, apologizing would be lying by misstating his case, he refused to apologize, and so they were both expelled. So there's, an, there's a real insight, I think, into his personality there. So here's what I've done. I've now, after giving you the facts, I've sort of just given you a quick list he really was very outgoing and social and likable. And so a born, a born leader, he's really athletic. Um, he's very smart. He's honest. He's honest. There was another case where he uh, took the day, an unauthorized day off from his work during high school, like his after school work, and he got one of his friends to cover for him, but he got found out. And the boss liked him so much, the boss was like, well, Herbert, you really weren't you weren't absent without leave, you know. You really, he wouldn't take it. He said, no, no, boss, I'm sorry. I did it on purpose. I'm guilty, you know, that kind of thing. And interestingly, he got promoted. He got a job promotion out of that. Now, he's risk-oriented, adventuresome and energetic, and, and I think that made him into the entrepreneurial spirit that he was. Like, he, since his dad worked for the railroad, which I haven't mentioned yet, he somehow or other could get passes on the railroad, but he got to places without any money. So he could get the railroad transportation free, but on arriving, he had no money. So he'd have to pick up jobs, do different things. So he's really sort of a, uh, you know, what the heck, let's, let's go do it. You know, the impossible takes a little longer kind of guy. And as I mentioned in that, you know, the deal with the jokes, he's, he does have a sense of humor. And if you, depending how well you can see that picture, he seems like a happy guy, you know, just sitting there. Uh, the world is, is his oyster there at age 25, 26. I couldn't think of a better place to put this in, so I put it in here to round out your sense of his, his personality. In 1957, which was two years before his death, he wrote um, The Education of a Poker Player, based on all of his experience uh, throughout his life playing poker. And uh, it's, a, it's a classic. I mean, uh, it, it's regarded as the last word in how to really get serious and play a good game of poker. And I think, interestingly, I'll just tell you and take it as it is, the introduction to this book was written by uh, Ian Fleming the author of all the James Bond novels. So, what, you know, what an interesting person. It is considered a classic. All right, so now into his early career. Graduates from high school, you know what kind of person he is. He did learn telegraphy, you know, telegraph, Morse code, etc. while working as a baggage clerk immediately after high school because his father was the telegrapher. And that set him up to become a railroad telegrapher, and that set him up to move around the state a little bit, and in those days, that was really uh, leading edge because 
trains, there weren't that many tracks, right? So you had to telegraph ahead, train number so-and-so, go to the siding while train, you know, comes by in the other direction. And it was a responsible job. So uh, he got better and better at that. And in 1912 decided Worthington was getting too small for him. He took the civil service exam. And he scored the, the best out of the, the people who took it that day and therefore was offered a job. And the particular job he got was a code clerk at the State Department in Washington, D.C., which is where those pictures I've shown you uh, come from, his early days there. Okay, now code room really is uh, multi-purpose. He did send and, and receive telegrams, but many of the ones he received were in code because they were to the State, the Secretary of State, or they were from State Department out to our ambassadors abroad. Or in one case, as I'll get to in a minute, they were between uh, Colonel House at this period in history, who was the confidential aide to President Wilson, and the White House, talking about you know the storm clouds of World War I. So uh, responsible job, and he put him, gave him a you know, fly on the wall view to how we do our secret communications, because these were all encoded. Now I'd add here, because uh, it seems appropriate too, just to give you a little more on Herbert, at this time he married Hazel Milam, went back to Worthington, sort of childhood sweethearts, I guess, or at least known to each other since they were children. And I thought it was interesting that he, he became engaged on May 12th and he was married on May 20th. So he had an eight day engagement. And then they came back to Washington, got a house in Washington, and uh, he resumed his job. So that's, that's how he started out. Now his awakening, I think, is fascinating. It occurred in August of uh, 1915, so World War I had been going on you know, since August 1914. Uh, he did do coded telegrams to and from important US interests, you know, government interests in foreign countries. And he asked himself the question, as any inquisitive person would, I guess, like, I wonder how secure these codes are, you know? And uh, secondarily, I wonder if anybody in other countries tries to break them so they can learn what the Americans are saying. Because remember now, we, we had Europe embroiled in the Great War, and the U.S. was on the sidelines. And, you know, uh, German-American Bunds and things were trying very hard to get us to come in on the side of Germany and, and their alliance. The British were trying very hard to get us to come in on the, uh, the British, the Triple Entente side. But we, we were somewhat, you know, undecided on that. So he asked himself the questions. Um, you know, my purpose in life is going to be cryptology. That's, that's what's, what's grabbed him. Even before he, he even tried it, really. And he said, perhaps I too, like the foreign cryptographer, could open the secrets of the capitals of the world. I mean, that is a pretty, pretty good vision. So, so that's his awakening. Now, I'll just ask you to read this entire quote, because I think this is out of his book, The American Black Chamber. I've seen them at the back, and it's, it's a great read. It's vivid. It's really good. Highly recommend it. But anyway, business is quiet. He gets a telegram from Colonel House to President Wilson. He goes, holy smokes, this must be important. This must be in the most difficult code ever imaginable. He sits himself down, and what happens? Two hours later, he breaks the code. It's just not difficult. He's an amateur at this point, too, right? He breaks the code. So, you know, imagine uh, his amazement. So what he does is he takes it to his boss. He goes, hey, boss, uh, this this is really unsatisfactory. I just broke the code. He took a chance, right? I mean, maybe he'd get fired for, you're not supposed to be listening in. But he, he wasn't fired. He was like, holy cow, that's serious, Herbert. Let's uh, give me some time. So a couple months later, his boss comes back. He goes, here you go. Here's one. He gives him a test, you know, encrypted message. And uh, it does take him longer. But the boss is like, you'll never break this one. We fixed the problem. Aha, you know, <laughs> so there. But no, I think a month. Five weeks, something like that later, he brings it back to the boss. There it is. Boom. Decoded. So in the meantime, he's been studying, obviously. But in the meantime, he's also been writing his treatise uh, on what American codes, uh, you know, how weak they are and what kind of problems they have and how easy they are to crack. And that becomes called the solution of American diplomatic codes. He gives that to his boss. Now, I've left out all the uh, back and forth that goes on, but essentially, uh, right there in 1917, he is transferred from the State Department, somewhat against their will, and put in the War Department, right, the predecessor to sort of current-day Defense Department. And he's commissioned a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army, and he is told to become the new head of MI-8, Military Intelligence Section 8 uh, crypt Cryptology. 
And there he is. So uh, on uh, July, in July, about a month later, he establishes MI8, Military Intelligence Section 8, the cryptologic section. And he is the sole employee. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he's got to hire people. He's got to figure out, what do I need? I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, really actually quite an amazing, perfect job for a person of his skills and his energy and his, um, you know, his intellectual power. So there he is, a little bit older. By now, it's 1917. I think that would put him at uh, 28 or 29. And he's head of the American cryptologic you know, effort. And World War, II, World War I has just sort of kicked off. America is now, now getting in it. So I've summarized World War I. The book will tell you about it. I really think it's great. Um, but during World War I, MI8 is estimated to have read 10,700 foreign messages. They solved about 50 codes in order to do so. Uh, and by the way, I, codes and ciphers, I'm, I know I'm putting them together, but uh, a code is a thing where you have a book and you look up whatever the item is and what you mean to say, like, you know, enemy in sight is TAV6 or something, and that's a code. But a cipher is where you transpose letters and use elaborate mathematical things to, tr to actually encipher words. So I, I'm treating them both together, but he was doing both of these things. Okay, and eight governments. So over 10,000 messages, 50 codes, eight governments. He was riding high. The country appreciated him. His workforce had grown a lot. In fact, at the end of the war, it was an armistice, and it was time for the Versailles Peace Treaties, right, where President Wilson went personally to attend for a while. Yardley went with him. Yardley became cryptologic support for the peace conference. What are these guys thinking in terms of slicing up Europe after the war? What are we going to impose this and that? So he was involved, and his section was involved breaking uh, codes and ciphers there. He says in his own words, the chief value of all this work has resided in the large and constant stream of information it has provided in regard to the attitudes, purposes, and plans of our neighbors. So he's just saying what I think we all take fairly for granted. You know, we, we like to know what the others are thinking. It improves all our bargaining positions in every way. But that's spelling it out. That's why it's valuable. So by now, he had been promoted to major. He'd been uh, awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, which was one of those wink of the eye, literally a wink of the eye, apparently, because it, it couldn't say, you're awarded this medal for breaking codes, you know? So it was like, you're awarded this medal for being a great guy and a good major in the Army and so forth. And, and when the person pinned on the medal, he actually gave him a wink, like, <laughs> we know better. All right, so what now? America's going back to peacetime. He's back in the country, and historically, you know, we usually dis disarm in between wars, and as a result, we're usually caught unprepared. In this case, he argued vehemently to don't get rid of the cryptologic section. And his pushback from other people were, well, you know, now it's peace again. We don't need to read other people's mail. We don't need to do that, do we? I mean, we're America. We're better than everybody else. But he actually uh, did obtain approval, and uh, it wasn't to continue MIA. It was to start something called the Cipher Bureau, okay? And the Cipher Bureau is what had the nickname the American Black Chamber. And that was named, uh, in turn, named after the French Black Chamber, which was their cryptologic cell. Here's some interesting things about it, because I think he, he's, so many of the things we take for granted today, he invented, for want of a better word. He established it in New York. Now, he couldn't do it in the district here, because congressional rules, I don't know the details, but they prevented him from spending this particular bunch of money in the district. So he had to look for another location. So he picked New York because that's where all the transatlantic cables came in. And the transatlantic cables were the major way that uh, high-level communications went back and forth in those days across the ocean in, in you know, fast, fast uh, time. So we'd have a, he'd have access to all their offices and he could, he could get their telegrams like he did, by the way, during World War I. Both the State Department and the War Department paid for it. It was a joint kind of project. I guess they were feeling out, you know, who will it be more valuable to. Um, he did return to civilian life and as its head. And so he became, you know, a civilian head of this civilian agency. And he even established a front organization. So he rented a building in New York, and the front office uh, read the Code Compiling Company. And what better front than to have a code compiling company where he would sell codes to businesses? Because, you know, businesses did transatlantic, transpacific communications as well, and they didn't want their 
competitors knowing what they're talking about. So he had a, a, a very actually profitable business going on the side in his front office operations, selling codes to businesses. And then meanwhile, in the back office, they're cracking all the foreign uh, communications. So think about all that new stuff that we take for granted now as kind of tradecraft, and he, he's the one. Now during the 20s, it's really the first two that uh, were most important. He was cracking Japanese codes primarily. That's because Japan, you know, emerged from World War I as, as an intact Pacific power, a growing, militarizing Pacific power. We are a Pacific power. So it's just natural that you'd be looking into Japanese codes. However, at the same time in 1921-22, the Washington Naval Conference was going on here in Washington. And the British, the Japanese, and the Americans, the three strongest naval powers in the world, were trying to decide how big their navies would be. So Britain was actually willing to accept the US on parity, but neither side wanted the Japanese to be as big. Right? So there were these ratios bandied about, like 10 to 6, 10 to 7. In other words, like every 10 American battleships, the Japanese could have seven. It was an arms control treaty, an attempt to limit arms. We now know it, it didn't work. But at the time, I mean, it was very positive, uh, and that's what we tried to do. So uh, he cracked those messages, and we knew exactly what the Japanese and to a, a, some extent the British were thinking all the way through that conference. And so it's just an, an excellent example of the Americans knowing the cards that the other groups held and being able to negotiate better as a result. And we did get what we wanted, and Japan did not get what they wanted. I'll get to that in a minute. Other things, though, that happened, and this will sound familiar, after the war, in which case Congress said, hey, the military can grab any communications they want from anybody. It was like a general warrant. They rescinded that. And so uh, Fourth Amendment protections, again, were in effect. And the telegram companies had a difficult decision to make whether to give stuff to Yardley or not. So some gave him stuff. Others didn't. But throughout the 20s, as peace you know, continued and the war went into the distance, uh, it got harder and harder for him to get his telegrams. And I mean, that's what he needed to be effective. So I guess you could argue that they were having trouble after the Washington Naval Conference uh, getting enough stuff to, to really be an impact player. There were also budgetary constraints. In my case, I don't think they played really heavily, but in fairness, you know, there were budgetary constraints. Um, and over time, he had a tendency to emphasize State Department customers. Um, you know, if you're being paid for jointly by the Army and the State Department, that would probably be a bad thing. But anyway, he did emphasize State Department customers. And then, in fairness, he began spending time on other projects. He was a real estate speculator. Does that sound good, like during the late 1920s? You're speculating in real estate. <laughs> You're speculating in stocks. Hmm. OK. So anyway, let's change the topic for a moment. 1929 rolls around. Henry Stimson becomes Secretary of State. There's a picture of Henry Stimson. Henry was a, uh, a well-known and uh, you know, well-respected American uh, diplomat and politician. He was now the Secretary of State under uh, the Republican Hoover administration. Now, what had been the practice is that this uh, American Black Chamber is really secret. I mean, it is really undercover. So the secretary has to be told that it exists. That's the first step, the new secretary. And so Yardley and his contacts at the State Department said to themselves, let's pick a good time. Let's pick a good time to tell him. So he's really wowed, and he goes, great, this is wonderful. So they did. They cracked this phenomenal. Uh, message from the Japanese again, it gave them a big diplomatic advantage, gave the Americans a big diplomatic advantage. And they used that as the time to tell Henry Stimson, the new secretary, say, well, by the way, Mr. Secretary, we have this thing called the Cipher Bureau, you know? And so uh, that's how Stimson found out about it. Yardley and his contact at state thinking, we're picking the very best time to tell the secretary this so he'll understand how important it is. Well, that is not the way Stimson reacted, okay? He has a very famous quote which it turns out not to be true. <laughs> but the quote that we all have heard before is, gentlemen, do not read other gentlemen's mail. I think it's a great quote. It's really snappy. And I think that's why that's the one we remember. But it turns out he actually said, gentlemen, do not read each other's mail. OK, same difference, right? Just not as catchy. So what did he mean? He meant that this was an underhanded, despicable act. And I, as America's chief diplomat, in a time of peace, you know, are just, I'm not going to go along with this. And so he shut it down, okay? He just, he just, boom, shut it down. Now, there are other, you know, versions of this story, but uh, from what I can tell, he was so fast and so definite about it 
that I think what he said first is what he meant. He meant that it was fundamentally the ethics, the problems with ethics of reading other people's mail, stealing telegrams and so forth, that he just couldn't see us doing as an upstanding nation in the, in the world of nations. All right? And so I, I backed that up by a quote he made later. Um, this is Stimson. The, the chief lesson I have learned in a long life is that the uh, only way you can make a man trustworthy is to trust him. Now think about this in terms of international affairs. I don't know how many idealists we have, how many realists we have, you know. But, uh, and the surest way to make him untrustworthy is to distrust him and show him you dis your distrust. So, the Americans, we, um, we will do better by being an honest simpleton in the world of nations rather than a designing Sherlock Holmes. So that was his, his viewpoint. And so he closed the Cypher Bureau in 1929. Literally like a week after the stock market crashed, the famous uh, stock market crash that ushered in the Great Depression. So here's where, Ar here's where Yardley finds himself. He's unemployed. Now in fairness, they felt bad about it. He was well liked. It's like, what can we do for Yardley? What can we do for Yardley? We're all surprised. He's out of a job. Well, they figured they could bring him back into the army and see what they could do. But for one reason or another, Maybe because of officer pay scales, I don't know, but they offered him half his former pay, half. So I don't know. We have good news and bad news, Herbert. You know, we want to give you a job and save you from uh, starvation on the streets. On the other hand, we're only going to pay you half, half what you're being paid for, and the job's the same. You know, it's the same level of effort. So they almost expected him to turn it down, and they did. He did, and that was their offer, and that was the last, the best offer he ever had. So he had no pension because he wasn't civil service; it was secret. He was off the books. So he had no money. He was angry and upset that the government would terminate its cryptologic functions. I mean, now there's a slightly different reason, right? Regardless of money, he felt like we are shooting ourselves in the foot. We are going to be in big trouble if we are not reading other gentlemen's mail. And he, by the way, by now he had had a child, so he had a wife and child to support. So I mean, it all plays into his publication in 1931 of the American Black Chamber. And there's, there's a the visual on that, and you have copies at the back. Um, it became a bestseller in 1932, and it was an international bestseller. People loved it. People loved it. Um, and it is. The style is great. He talks about secret agents, secret ink, dead drops, uh, beautiful temptresses, uh, as well as elaborate code breaking, cipher breaking, um, and the impact that it had. And uh, he is actually, uh, during the war, they were responsible for catching some German saboteur that was actually hung. You know, so I mean, very tangible results there. And he describes all this. So what I've decided to do is, uh, that's him, about the age when he published uh, The American Black Chamber. And I have a few things I know you won't be able to actually read, but you can kind of get a visual on them. The little writing in here is invisible ink, was invisible ink, until the American, until MI8 figured it out and developed the ink and said, you know, talked about what it said. So what it says, and then the top is another language, and just as, hi, honey, how are you, the weather's fine, kind of stuff. So um, at the bottom it says, secret writing in German between the lines of a letter in French from Brazil to Germany. The message referred to the raid of the German submarine U-53 on American ports and the impression produced in South America by this event. So in other words, an agent in South America reporting back. That's an actual copy, by the way, right? So Yardley has copies of, of this stuff. All right, now this one I know you can't read either, but this is a code book. So those numbers, you know, on the left are just numbers, and then it is, tells you what the numbers mean. So this is a page of the German high fleet code stolen by a secret agent from within the German admiralty. That's sure to make friends in Germany, right? I mean, they're going to be very happy to hear we were stealing stuff. Now, this one, you, I believe, I hope you can read, because this, to me, is, is really, really fascinating. Take a minute and have a look at that. This is the Japanese government in 1921 during the Washington Naval Conference instructing its negotiating team what to do at the conference. Now, the language is somewhat stilted, um, but at the very bottom, right, it says number four. Option number four is to be avoided as far as possible. Option number four is the one we wanted. It 
10 to 6 ratio, where Japan would be weaker compared to us. And all this other stuff is, we want 10 to 7, but if you really, 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 really have to, go to 6.5. But if you really, really, really have to, that's the pivotal point. Go to 10.6. So here we are. We're American dip diplomats. We know the Japanese will go to 10.6 if we just dig in our heels and we're skillful and we just hang in there. I mean, talk about valuable intelligence. So they did. And we, we dug in our heels. They capitulated and we ended up with 10 to 6 ratio. So uh, he's publishing this in this bestseller, saying that we had the Japanese wired the whole time and we knew what was going on. So think about that. Okay, and then it has things on secret inks, dead drops, honey traps, theft of documents from foreign embassies, capture of beautiful secret agents, capture of foreign saboteurs. I mean, it's, it's juicy. And he's got a lot of illustrations, stuff that he must have kept when he left MI8 and went to the Washington Naval Conference on the ABC, you know, American Black Chamber, and he kept it. So I don't know how many laws are being broken there. Okay, so look, that's, that's the event. That's the event. Now, uh, I can give you more of his, his life, but uh, I'd like to just digress a little bit here uh, and let you know now the other side, okay, which I call the backlash. He never went to jail. He was never uh, indicted for anything, but he had a backlash that affected him for the rest of his life. Uh, I'll just read some of these off. First off, I should say that many of the people in the know said he exaggerated things. He tended to claim a lot of personal achievements where team efforts were involved. So I don't know. He began to emerge as a person who was very much self-interested and tended to self-advertise maybe and not give credit where credit was due. So I don't know, blemish on his you know, uh, approach. He was charged with treason for disclosing this information, secret information. How did he answer that? He said, well, you closed the black chamber. We're not doing it anymore, so who cares if I tell them what we used to do? We don't do it anymore. So he kind of threw it back in their face, you know, that you're the guys who stopped it. I think it's serious that you stopped it. I'm blowing the whistle. I'm blowing the whistle on you guys. Because I want you to keep doing it. I am, I'm a patriot. I'm a knowledgeable patriot, and I, if I don't blow the whistle, who will? That's his, that's his attitude. Okay. Now, there were charges of damage to U.S. diplomatic interests, and yes, they were damaged. Um, they did come to his house and tried to confiscate all those materials that he published in the book and more. And he just said, nope, won't let you. And it was the army actually showing up at his front door to do it, and they didn't have any authority. And, uh, you know, they're trying to work on, like, well, what legal basis do we have for crashing into his house? And, and believe it or not, back then, there really wasn't. When, when you looked at it, there was no real law in place that would enable us to confiscate that stuff. So he kept it. Um, they did try to pass a law making his action illegal, which, of course, is against the Constitution. You can't, like, make a law later that punishes people previously. But, but they did. They tried to pass that. It wouldn't pass. Um, they did confiscate his follow-on work. He wrote a book on Japanese diplomatic secrets with a co-author. And he was really going to tear apart the Washington Naval Conference this time, show all kinds of stuff. Um, this book has the dubious distinction of being the first and only manuscript to be seized and impounded by the US government for national security reasons. It's the only one. It was sitting in manila folders until uh, James Bamford, who wrote The Puzzle Palace, kind of the history of the NSA, uh, did a Freedom of Information Act and got it released. But they actually did confiscate his follow-on book. And then they did make what he did illegal, just not for him, but, you know, for subsequent cases. And if you read through that, it just basically says that if you come into possession of foreign diplomatic correspondence and codes associated with same and the ways to break codes associated with same and so on and so forth, you'll go to jail. It's, it's a felony. So have a look at that. But uh, this law was actually hotly contested and barely passed because uh, many of the senators in the Senate in particular felt it was a gag order. You are going against Americans' First Amendment rights. You're, you're restricting them further than had been done to that point. Okay, so uh, fine not more than $10,000 or in prison for not more than 10 years or both. And I think $10,000 was a pretty good piece of change back then. Now there's more. The backlash continues. He was denied opportunities for federal employment on many occasions, even when the war clouds of World War II began to generate up, and it was like, holy smokes, <laughs> the, the good times, the peace is, is over, you know? It was just hard feelings all around. Um, they did charge that Yardley's whistleblowing about U.S. breaking of Japanese codes 
led the Japanese government to change the codes and make them harder. So it became more difficult for us and gave us a military disadvantage for World War II. Now, a counter argument is, and it's purely accidental, but that by blowing the whistle in 31, the Japanese changed their codes right away. And that gave us, you know, what, almost 10 years to break their more difficult codes. And so in a way, he helped, in a backhanded way, he helped us by telling Japanese they changed their codes, gave us more time to break the codes, and we did break the codes. So it, it's a funny sort of thing how, how it worked out. He did end up working for the Chinese for a while. These were the nationalist Chinese that were fighting the Japanese who had invaded China. Uh, and he got criticism for that. Uh, but as far as we know, he, he like didn't sell US secrets uh, in the bargain. Um, they also prevented him from continuing his employment with the Canadians in 1941. He was helping the Canadians stand up a cryptologic bureau, but some wheeling and dealing in Washington uh, turned that off and prevented that. Okay, so that's the price he paid, and, and it did stay with him uh, for the remainder of his life. So that's the Yardley saga. So here's some questions. They don't have to be the only questions. But just to stimulate thought, right? Was Yardley right to blow the whistle? Was he right to blow the whistle? Uh, think about that. Now, I would ask the secondary question, well, OK, if he was right, why didn't we suffer more in World War II? I mean, he says, you just get rid of this cryptologic bureau. We are in big trouble. Now, you know your history, it turns out we did manage to break the Japanese code. We broke some other codes. And, and code breaking had a major role to play in World War II and the outcome for the United States. So that's a bit of a, uh, a paradox, if you think of it that way. But it, it's the, the reason is straightforward. Everybody understands it. It turns out that the War Department kept a cryptologic bureau, and the Navy Department, which was separate in those days, kept a cryptologic bureau. Because if you think about it, just purely military communications need codes, right? Just to send codes. Plus, uh, wireless communication was coming in to, to common use. So anybody could pluck them off the air. So codes became even more important. So that's why we didn't lose World War II, among other things, OK? And so th the reason I bring that up is I think if Yardley, if the American Black Chamber had been the only organization doing this, in our country, we would have been in a, a real problem at the onset of World War II. And we were saved by the fact that both branches of the military, the Army and the Navy, kept doing it and kept making advances. So is it luck? Uh, I don't know. But I do know that Stimson didn't take that into consideration when he closed down the chamber. He closed down the chamber because it was the wrong thing to do. So at the end of the day, Yardley is the father of US cryptology. He's, he's revered by, by many who know of him. I mean, other people think he's a traitor. That's, that's our discussion, right? But uh, there's no doubt that he brought cryptology into the mainstream of American intelligence, and he invented a lot of the stuff going on, and he made a difference, a decisive difference. So then that, so let's say, hold for now, Yardley's right. All right, that maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Does that mean Stimson was wrong? Or to ask the question another way, was Stimson right or wrong? in his actions. And this uh, is out of uh, James Bamford's Puzzle Palace. I think it's, it's well said. It is one of cryptology's supreme ironies that the man who now believed that too little attention had been shown the intercepted diplomatic traffic about the Pearl Harbor attack um, was the same man who a dozen years earlier had slam closed Herbert Yardley's black chamber with the statement, gentlemen, do not read each other's mail. Isn't that ironic? So. So what do we do? What, was Stimson wrong? Now, so we asked him, Stimson, were you wrong? And this is his answer. In 1929, Stimson later wrote, uh, the world was striving with goodwill for lasting peace. And in this effort, all the nations were parties. Then, speaking in the third person, Stimson continued, Stimson, Secretary of State, was dealing as a gentleman with the gentlemen sent as ambassadors and ministers from friendly nations. Now." As Secretary of War, the gentleman had turned warrior. And I, didn't, I should have said that earlier, but in, the real irony is that uh, he was Secretary of State in the Hoover administration. He's Secretary of War in the Democratic Roosevelt administration, which speaks well, I mean, for his uh, 
capabilities, right? I mean, both sides of the aisle are having him in high cabinet positions. But there, he just turned on a dime. When I'm Secretary of State, I'm a gentleman. When I'm Secretary of War, I'm a warrior. I mean, that's how I take that down. So he really didn't apologize. Uh, he just explained it. So that's Stimson's actions. OK, so can Yardley's whistleblowing about the existence of the American Black Chamber help us understand and respond to Snowden? Right? That's, that's sort of what I leave you with. What happened in the meantime, after Snowden's revelations, is not, well, I'll let you decide. Project PRISM is canceled at the end of 2015. That's because a lot of uh, court cases were brought to bear for two reasons. That the bulk collection of, of metadata violated uh, the Constitution, primarily because um, you can't have a warrant without saying what you're looking for other than patterns. You know, I mean, you can't bulk collect. But the project couldn't decide what they were looking for until they did the bulk collection. See, that's, that's the inherent problem. Then the second ground that they used was it's illegal because the justification being used was uh, Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act, which uh, stretched the ability of the government to get warrants under a lower standard of evidence. Okay, and then a number of court cases said it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, it is constitutional. It was really tied up in the courts, and there were decisions that, that were both ways. And so this all happened when Congress, this past June, had to vote on whether to let Section 215 go away. It was part of the sunset provisions put into the USA Patriot Act. That's when they closed, it was in the news, they closed the project down for a day, and there was that you know news about, hey, this will hurt our security, this won't hurt our security. Then they passed the USA Freedom Act, and the USA Freedom Act essentially gave the NSA six months to get their house in order, and then they're closing the project. And then about a month later, the NSA said, uh, and then we will destroy all of our archived data as well. So we'll stop the collection, we will stop our archiving, and we'll destroy the archives we have. And they argued before that they needed the archives in case they found something suspicious, they could go back and see if they you know, had a, bit, a more robust case. That, that was the reason. So yes, yeah, Snowden's actions have had real effects. We have stopped the bulk collection of metadata to try to look for patterns to try to detect terrorists. So that's what's happened. So now, was he right then to blow the whistle on Project Prism? And a little provocative, right? But so is he a Yardley? Should he be treated as a hero? He is speaking truth to power. He said to himself, hey, all these guys are violating our rights, and they're making us into a police state, and that's not me. That's not America. I'm going to stand up and be heard. Okay, and that's his quote there. I don't want to live in a world where there's no privacy and therefore no room for intellectual exploration and creativity. What Project Prism is doing poses an existential threat to democracy. And that's, that's his story, and that's, that's what he repeats frequently. So that's the one side. Is he a Yardley? Is, is he like a hero? But I would offer, maybe he's a Stimson, right? You can look at this parable in two ways. Um, is he out of step with the times? This is Snowden. Is Snowden out of step with the times? Much like Stimson was out of step with the times. I mean, we can assume everybody else doing data mining if they have the capability. Is it going to produce results? Um, in other words, is the value to be obtained from data mining such that perhaps we should change our concept of privacy in America? Which means keep the project going, right, or some other form. So, I mean, is he a Yardley? Is he... A Stimson. So there, I put, him, I put both of them on one slide. And uh, maybe he's neither. Maybe he's neither. But I do think the Yardley and Stimson controversy, the whistleblowing, does at least have relevance for us to help sort through the Snowden event. Now, I just have a couple more slides. I'll come back to this one. There's further reading. I really recommend the David Kahn book, The Reader of Gentleman's Mail. He's the more the dispassionate Yardley. Bamford is part of, Yardley's part of his puzzle palace about the NSA's tough read, but really good. And uh, Her Herbert Yardley's book, which you have in the back, uh, is really just great reading. Leave your Michael Crichton one aside for a moment, you know, or <laughs> Clive Cussler for light reading, and do him for light reading. I mean, it's, it's good. All right, and then uh, my book is a 2011 book, which isn't about Yardley. It's not about any of, of the specifics of this case. But um, it does talk about information flows 
in the intelligence community, what we have and what we might need, the differences between counterterrorism and the differences between a state actor and what we might need from an intelligence perspective. And it does argue that a revolution in intelligence affairs is needed. Uh, and much of it is about information flows and the need for data. So it was, uh, it's not started or finished because of this, but it, in a couple years ahead, but um, you know, that's, that's actually what I do my research on. I want to mention that we had trouble getting that book. We will have it by the end of this series, but Bill, if you're interested in it, Bill can sign book plates today and our, our retail folks will have it by the end of the Smithsonian series. So Perfect. sorry about that. Okay, so now for, for discussion, is Snowden a Yardley? Is Snowden a Stimson? Is maybe something else altogether? What do you think? Or any questions, really? Yes. Hi. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Snowden release boatloads of other information besides just the existence of PRISM? Yes, he did. He had a number of, from, for example, emails from different uh, heads of state, intercepts of the heads of state emails, not unlike uh, the intercepts of Japanese diplomatic right. messages, you know, that kind of thing. And he just put them out there because, I mean, you don't have to write a book nowadays. Yeah, so, so in my mind, that distinguishes uh, Snowden from Yardley in the sense that Yardley was talking about the specifics of the issue that he had as opposed to releasing all of this unrelated but damaging information. So, my thought. Okay, and that, that's a possibility. Anybody want to? Yes, go ahead. Oh, wait, wait, please. I have a question, but it's actually kind of uh, going away from what he's talking about. Did uh, Yardley take any kind of oath of loyalty to the US? Um, I know, Years ago, when I went into the government, I did. I don't remember even what it was about. I think I was pretty loyal. And did Snowden have to? I mean, if you take an oath, what does that mean? And what did, what did they take? Right. Um, I don't know what Snowden took, but I'm sure it's the, the, the modern version of the one Yardley took. He did. He swore an oath to basically support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And then I think each department of government has a slightly different second part, you know. So, okay, and then uh, in our era, I mean, in our era, he signs a non-disclosure agreement uh, because of the high security clearance he's given, which basically says you tell anybody, you go to jail, right? Um, okay, all right, so, but, right. And, and there was a okay, question. Hold on, let me uh, answer this gentleman's question, though. Uh, yes, he did release more, so you can look at it as a, what, not as focused, or he didn't really, he doesn't really mean that quote that I gave you, or you can just say it's other examples of how surveilled everybody is, but you, you know, that depends how you look at it. That's, that's how I would answer that question, which did have a, a backlash, by the way, uh, an international backlash against U.S. diplomatic interests. Okay. There's, a lady. There's somebody in the very back, too. Are you, no more? Okay. To me, it's uh, not simply a case of right or wrong. There are, one could argue that one's obligation to take, keep the oath outweighs any non-disclosure. That if you, what, I don't know if anyone has made this argument, but one could go into court and say, the non-disclosure agreement, via my oath to protect and defend the Constitution outweighs any non-disclosure because the non-disclosure clause is unconstitutional to the extent that it contradicts the oath. And um, the, there are also unintended consequences. Yardley and Snowden may have gone public because they thought uh, in Yardley's case, and this was terrible that the program had ended, but one would have to be dense if one lived in a foreign country not to recognize that a program that was ended could be uh, resumed in short order. And the same with PRISM, that the NSA, even if it keeps its word, could resume that fairly quickly. So it is a warning across the, the bow, however, even if the, uh, neither author intended that, that someone, someone reading Yardley's book in the 1930s in Berlin or Moscow would soon be aware that the United States had 
uh, a first a crack cryptographic effort which could be resumed at any time, and um, the same with reading Snowden's details that one could recognize that the C the NSA could uh, resume Operation Prism and and metadata whenever it pleases, even if uh, it its pleasure was not what Congress had actually passed. Okay, and are you, does that make you lean one way or the other, or are you more of the honest broker in the middle? No, but I mean, you're looking at different elements, the different ways it could cut. Yeah, one thing I do want to key on, because it, it's another answer, actually, to, to my answer to your question, ma'am, in the back, is you're saying it's cut and dry because you violated the Constitution or non-disclosure. You're saying it's not cut and dry, because what if you feel that the non-disclosure agreement you signed in good faith, and now down the road, this is going badly as I see it, and my previous oath supersedes, the oath to defend the Constitution supersedes, which is, you know, it's another, definitely another way of looking at it. I have a ton of people who okay. all want me to bring them the microphone. Thank which, you. Oh, thank you. Um, after the Patriot Act was passed, the Washington Post did publish articles like on the FBI letters and the collection of metadata it's way back when. So excluding the other things that Snowden disclosed, which were questionable, he, to me, he really didn't, on that issue, did not disclose anything the Washington Post had not disclosed. That's what I'm curious on, because the Post was publishing articles on this. On the, uh, the whole thing? The uh, different emails? Our collection the, of uh, mm -hmm. metadata mm -hmm. uh, by the National Security Agency back in 2004, it was in the Post. Yeah, I guess... Uh, that's a very good observation. Uh, just a very quick background is uh, there was a project called Carnivore, which is a terrible name for a project if you want to have popular support. But that was the one that first started, I, I believe, I mean, as much as you can know these things, it started the vacuum cleaner effect, looking for different databases that would shed light on terrorists trying to hide, you know, between the cracks of globalization. That became, I believe, total information awareness with TIA, which you may request, uh, you may remember was definitely shouted down and, and terminated, but it wasn't terminated. There was another program with a different name. And then, uh, I can't remember that one, unfortunately. And then I believe PRISM might be like a fifth generation similarity to things we have been trying to do with due regard to civil liberties. Now, the Patriot Act, I guess, gave us a, an extra way to, uh, you know, somewhat relax standards to be able to go after it. So what your conclusion would be is whistleblowing wasn't as... Uh, well, my question is, it's already published in the... I guess my question is, if it's already being published in the Washington Post about the metadata collection and the scarfing up of metadata by the NSA and the FBI letters and things like this, was Snowden giving anything new on that particular topic? I, yes, and I... Apparently so, <laughs> just judging from the reaction. But I don't know the answer to that. Nothing radically new. I mean, anybody who's keeping track knew that we're, we're looking at a data mine. I mean, you know, supermarkets do it. Hospitals do it. On the computer, when you key in and you just happen to have looked at a IKEA and then suddenly there's an IKEA ad, I mean, they're doing it. So uh, nevertheless, I mean, he's a whistleblower. It was, uh, I am doing this and I'm fleeing because you are on one step out of jail. Now, the Obama administration's position, uh, as restated just this past summer after the USA Freedom Act, is you are a convict, you know, you are a, there's a warrant for your arrest and we want you to come back. And if you really are a whistleblower and you really care about the Constitution, then you should stand up to all come back, take your punishment, and, you know, let the chips fall where they may because your message has been sent. And that, that you say that's your intention. I recently lost my iPhone and did the find my phone and I watched my phone travel. I watched where it exactly was. And it really made me realize I'm wearing a tracking device. <laughs> I recently subscribed to Amazon Photos and I had a friend of mine who's a uh, chief security officer at one of the healthcare firms and I said, this is awesome, you gotta try this out. He goes, you know why they're doing it, right? And I said, no. He said, well, they're taking all your pictures and they're searching them. They have all the metadata that tells where that picture was taken. They're looking in that picture and identifying whether you drive a nice car or what you 
like to do and gaining just a ton of information for those free photo services. Who, who's they, the marketers? Different the marketers. Companies? And so there are these big data warehousing companies that exist currently that Amazon can go buy all the telegrams from, all the data from. So can the NSA now just go to these commercially available databases and say, hey, I'd like to buy all the information about Bill Lahneman. Well, see, that you strike at the heart of, of an issue in our country is uh, the government has to follow the Constitution. <laughs> no doubt, right? What about a private firm? I mean, if you invent something new, uh, all things are legal until made illegal in our country. So if you invent something new like data mining, go for it. It's like uh, those calls we used to get at dinner. The, the, yeah, they, no, they were just awful, you know. And finally, it got so bad that we made it a law of the no-caller list and things. So, I mean, businesses have a better ability to do, in this case, data mining. And so if the NSA buys the data or compels, like the telecommunications companies, to give them the metadata, does that violate the Constitution? I mean, they're going around, arguably, right? They're going around to another authorized agent but buying something or compelling them to give them something that is actually prohibited from them to do themselves because they have to abide by the Constitution. Yes. What is the law today? What is the successor to PRISM, if there is one? Well, PRISM is, uh, I don't know if they've just quietly changed the name, but uh, they have until December 20th, well, let's say, to shut it down. And the NSA has said they will get rid of the archives and uh, stop bulk collection. As, now, as I understand it, they, they will be able to access data from private companies themselves, but can't store it themselves. So they, would, they could do that, and they have to have a warrant to do it, and they can still have access to that information. I see that as a potential workaround. Because uh, one of the things, you know, the example I gave about the, the newborns being tracked in real, near real time, about perhaps having a a medical problem, um, we don't need to store data anymore. For big data, you can kind of tap into the stream and analyze it and get what you need. Now, you won't have archives to depending what value they would have been, but you're right. So I see a way that they could stay within the law is, okay, we're not going to collect it. We're just going to, what do you call that? You tap into it, you uh, monitor it, you... Uh, I'm not being you know, cynical. I'm just trying to think of a way, as, as you've suggested, that uh, given the increased computing power, we could still do it. And it wouldn't have the same footprints as Project PRISM had. So that, that would be my response to that. Within the framework of uh, government, what alternatives would there be to uh, people who recognize uh, something that they see as abhorrent occurring uh, in a government program? Is there, is there some alternative to going public? And how would you, com if there, uh, I assume there is, and how would you compare the availability of that to Yardley uh, as compared to Snowden uh, at this time? I think Snowden today has more clear recourses available to him. Namely, there are whistleblower laws that protect whistleblowers. Um, whistleblowers seem to be very reluctant to blow the whistle within the context of that law. I guess, I don't know. Anybody have experience with that or in your jobs? Or, there's a gentleman there. Hold on, please. Hold on. Hold on. I don't have personal experience, but I have acquaintances who have. And yes, they are afraid to report it. It's your job. And it's not viable to attempt to go up the chain of command. It just, just does not work. Well, there. So there's one, one data point. Uh, it's a law, but there's, a, there's official rules and there's unofficial rules. And I think you talk about a backlash. You incur an immediate backlash by operating within the law. Now, the other way is to uh, just do it, but suffer the consequences. You should you know, stand there, wait for the police, put the cuffs on, go to trial. He didn't do that. He's, he's in Russia. But neither of those are very palatable. So how about anybody else have thoughts on the whistleblowing? Is it, yes? I mean, I think 
actually blown the whistle before uh, with my company and what it was doing with, I won't say the company's name, but they were monkeying around with the financial formulas for mortgages. And when they told me to change the formula so that it didn't look like all of our ratings were so bad, I refused. And I went up in, up the chain of command. Having been in the military, I knew how to do that. But I still was kicked off the project. I, well, no, I got another job in the same company at a better position. But I still lost my position on that project. And six months later, the person who told me to change the formulas was fired. Well, there, see, there's an, another complexity to it. So uh, I'm thinking I might have had another thought on that. No, I, so that, yeah, it's not, the government has tried to provide for freedom of speech and uh, positive impact of whistleblowers, but the laws oftentimes seem to be just one of those laws that don't really work very well in practice because of the unofficial downstream effects. Attempts to, to improve the, the ability of someone to go up a chain of command, some independent uh, element in government like the, 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 uh, the courts that you have to go to in order to get a warrant that sit independently. If, if you're not willing to do that because it doesn't work, but you are willing to go out and make it public, you're going to lose your job anyway. So, I, I, I mean, why not improve the government's ability to handle it and stifle that? that... Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Here's. There were, uh, there have been a number of measures undertaken to enable people who carry classifications to blow the whistle. Um, I, when I was in CIA, I served a stint with the Inspector General. Uh, the Inspector General now for the intelligence community is approved by the Senate. And uh, it, so it's a legislatively approved Inspector General. The IG, for example, in CIA, if he believes the director is violating the law, can go to the president. And that's a very unique access for Inspector Generals, uh, Inspector General. Um, any employee has the right to go to the oversight committees, the intelligence oversight committees, and report what they consider. And they can do that because the intelligence oversight committees have the authority to hear out an employee who is bringing something to their attention. Uh, and the intelligence com the committees, by the way, are typically select committees. So they are selected by the leadership of the Congress. So you have, though there are the inspectors general, the oversight committees, uh, the president's foreign intelligence boards, and and also the IOB, the in, the intelligence oversight board. It it is still a problem because people still have a fear. Well, if I take it to my superior, whatever it is, they're not going to do anything. Uh, Snowden certainly had recourse to other avenues. He claims and I've talked to NSA people, that he went to people in the NSA to bring it to their attention. That hasn't been verified. Uh, I think he wrote one note to the Inspector General, but it was a very innocuous subject. It wasn't trying to bring the attention of, of uh, these violations. The, the only other comment I would make <clears throat> is that beyond PRISM, and frankly, I think if terrorism becomes more pronounced in our country, and there are more lone wolves, you may see the public clamoring for the government to reinstitute PRISM uh, because it enables them much more quickly to link phone calls to terrorists, to people who are known terrorists abroad. But I think in Snowden's case, he actually exposed all sorts of information that had nothing to do with domestic abuse. It had to do with our coverage of, of uh, foreign topics, like uh, covering the Prime Minister of Germany and so forth and so on. So it went well beyond uh, domestic abuse. Thank you. I should have mentioned, that reminded me of two things. Uh, does anybody have any trouble with us reading other gentlemen's mail at this point in history? In other words, do you expect your intelligence community to be intercepting messages and decoding them and finding out what others are doing? So, I mean, you think about that, you know, and. Uh, Here's a question. Yes, question? Wait, please, wait. 
reading the specifics of somebody's mail, I think, is different than collecting the metadata of people's mail. Because if you're looking at keyword patterns, I've done data mining. That was part of my job. Um, and you don't, there's too much data to come through to read an individual's mail until you pop up the keywords and you see a pattern in the keywords, then read it. Well, actually, that's where I was, I was going with that. Is, does anybody have any problem then with the bulk collection of metadata? In other words, that would be, if we pass the correct laws, another exception to our guarantee to our Fourth Amendment rights that, you know, we can be secure in our persons and papers and so on and so forth. So, I mean, that's, there is a legal way to do it. Uh, and they were doing it legally uh, by getting those warrants, but then the warrants have been, um, as, as our system works, the warrants have been considered a little bit loose. And so one thing led to another and Congress did not renew it. But it's within our power if we decide that doing this is good to uh, modify the law. Okay, and then in a minute, one other thing. Uh, I just wanted to mention that our intelligence community has more oversight than any other. I mean, so you take the absolute viewpoint, but sometimes it's helpful to take the relative viewpoint. I have colleagues in uh, the UK, in fact, who are always saying, you guys, you, you sweat this stuff too much. I mean, it's basically what they say. And then uh, they're a lot, they have a special secrets act, you know, I mean, they talk about rights not being honored. So uh, we do have a substantial oversight to kind of keep everybody driving in the lanes. The one interesting thing is that you know, we do sign away our rights a lot of times for like, you know, Google is, Google as a gentleman is reading everybody's mail who has a Gmail account. And we've all signed that right away. I, I kind of understand Snowden's uh, motivation for what he did, but how much of Yardley's was the fact that he was unemployed and had people to support and, and how much of it was, hey, I'm really trying to do the right thing versus, hey, I need to make some money here. Well, you can imagine he was charged with that. I mean, the first thing that came to people's mind was you needed a way to make some money fast and you found it, didn't you? And so yeah, that's still, you know, another way of viewing Yardley is that he himself is an opportunist. I don't know if you could look at Snowden. It's the first time it's really occurred to me. Is he an opportunist? He may be a lot of things. I don't know if he's an opportunist. You think he is? Yeah. I just can't hear you. That's okay. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. I think he did what he did so that he could get his 15 minutes of fame. I definitely believe that there were ways he could have let everybody know that we were connecting, collecting metadata. He really wasn't, well, I can't even say what I want to say right now. Yeah, okay, but an opportun you're, you're positive on the opportunist oh, yeah, uh, definitely an opportunist. theory. Okay, now. Oh. Well, I think it's interesting that Snowden talks about democracy because he was not an elected official. official, um, And he went outside of our de democratic system. Uh, the president is elected. President appoints the national security advisor, and then you go down, and then you contract out. And that's all part of the democracy. It's very cumbersome. And it's very difficult to deal with the, you know, um, the uh, layers in the government just make it really hard to, you know, make things easy to, look, this is an important point. Please listen to me. And, one, you know, one of the problems you have is if there's something wrong, you have to go to your boss. And uh, because that's the person you report to, and you can't go over your boss's head. If you go outside, you know, so it is pretty hard, and that's why you have all of these, you know, laws and whistleblower laws. And uh, one thing I've, the little bit I've seen of whistleblowers, they're cocky, they think they know it all. And, uh, I, you know, I haven't listened to any of Snowden's uh, interviews. But to me, he just seemed like he, you know, I know everything about what democracy means. Well, we've had a system for well over 200 years to, and yes, it's cumbersome, but if you, uh, I, that's why I think he was wrong, because he was deciding what democracy is, 
and forgetting about the other millions of Americans who vote. So it might be one of those difficult choices, kind of like Thoreau poses, you know, that say what you want, but then go to jail. I mean, say what you want, but pay the price. That's the price of liberty. Uh, I think, who's next? I think I'm probably one of the very few people in the room who's kind of sympathetic to Yardley and what he did. Um, he was treated extremely badly. There's, he's a smart, wonderful guy who did wonderful things and was treated with terrible disrespect. Here, we'll give you half your pay or really nothing. And then, oh my God, you wanted to write a book and say how cool you were. I don't know, he didn't do irreparable harm as near as I can tell. People bought the book, everybody, bestseller, they thought it was rivetingly interesting, got people interested in the whole idea of spies and honey traps and all of that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not convinced that he was some bad guy. There you go. Okay, good. I mean, and uh, he's on the NSA's webpage as a, you know, as a father of cryptology. Uh, he has stature. Why is there such a generational gap with all the old people like me thinking the, the Snowden is a villain and the young people thinking he's a hero? Well, if I knew that, I would have an op-ed piece in the post <laughs> tomorrow. Um, is, that, is that, are you answering that question? No. Uh, anybody else? Why do you think that is? Because, uh, you, you know, we opened a Twitter account. You're probably all aware of that. And it's soared as, it's. Look, it's a young person. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I don't know if I can speak for every young person ever, but oh, feel uh, feel free, right? <laughs> so at least personally, the way that I see Snowden is that he kind of came out in a way that, that no one, at least from my perspective, had done that before. I mean, it, what I saw was he was coming out and saying that he sees something incredibly wrong with the system. It wasn't just the fact that we were metadata collecting; it was the fact that there wasn't any regulation about it. That's what scares me, at least, most about it is you know we don't have laws in place that keep things from being exploited at least from my perspective. Okay, all right. Now, shall we have one more? We, yeah, we can probably do two more. And if points for someone who hasn't spoken yet. Uh, there Looks we are. like they're, they're. Oh, keep your hand up, please. <laughs> it's on, yeah. You're good yeah. to go. I, I would like to hear your opinion on, uh, if Snowden came back to the States, do you honestly think that he would get uh, a fair trial, or might the government use every uh, tool in its uh, in its box in order to keep key witnesses secret, uh, keep things secret which the government or the prosecutors think it's prudent to keep secret, not allow Snowden? Of, I guess it comes down to this: Do you think? He is being unreasonable in thinking he wouldn't get a fair trial in every sense of the word. Your opinion. So, so would he get a fair trial? Right. Right. In um, your opinion. Well, my opinion, they probably would try to invoke the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court because, I mean, who can tell what, to what areas the discourse would go, you know, about classified materials? So in typical cases like that, the court itself is secret, which people argue does allow certain latitude to be taken, um, calling witnesses and you know being confronted and such. Um, but that is another agreement we've made with the Constitution and, and our feelings about civil liberties to be able to have secret intelligence activities going on. Now, maybe some people would argue for open court but th there would be a lot of classified stuff that would probably percolate to the surface. So I think my answer would be it would be held in a secret court and we never would exactly know what went on. And we'd have to hope for the best that the people that are in that court, and the judges rotate in and out. They're judges that are considered really solid, good Americans, and they go in and do it for a little while and come back out to their other bench. So, I mean, that would be a, probably a compromise. Snowden is well aware he would be confronted with that he wouldn't have an open trial. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, I believe he would get a fair trial. There is a provision now. I was also chief of litigation for the clandestine service uh, and providing uh, information to the court. And one of the pieces of legislation passed is called SEPA, the Classified Information Procedures Act, which enables anybody, either the defense or the prosecution, to introduce evidence in open court, in an open trial, stipulating that this information was classified to this effect. And that's now been used over and over. The reason for it was to prevent people from engaging in gray mail, which is because they've done something, they go to court and they say to the government, oh, if you try me, I'm going to reveal all this information. What this does is now give the, the uh, judiciary the authority to stipulate that information is classified, defense has a right, the defense has a right to see it and know of it, and so you could certainly have a fair trial. And I think given the high profile of the Snowden case, I think that the government would be hard pressed to try and go for anything secret. I think it would go to, a, to an open court, you know, fair trial. OK, does that, does that wrap us up? Or is there? OK, I'm fluttered. Uh, there are two wholly separate issues. The first is the ethics of what Snowden did, and the second is how the U.S. government should respond. And I always thought it was an absolute error of folly to denounce him and label him a traitor, that I always felt the real solution was to work out a private agreement with him so he voluntarily leaves Russia, does not face a trial, no, give, no at venue for publicity, and quietly works with the U.S. government to patch up holes and uh, get some of his, what he wants, uh, uh, officially agreed to, and uh, make the the rest of the, of the security apparatus more secure. In other words, gently pat him on the head, uh, a very light sentence, if any, but no tr public trial. Do you think that would encourage a lot of other whistleblowers, though? Would you have an out-of-control whistleblowing? All right. Well, I can see. I can see that I stimulated a lot of good questions, and I'm I'm very glad. It's been a pleasure. Bill, thank you very much for a very provocative lecture, and, and leading a great discussion. And thank you all for your participation. Thank it was you a terrific all. presentation. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much, Bill. Oh, sure. yeah.